Welcome everybody. If you want to follow along with our message today, you can go to rmfchurch.org, click on media, then click on notes, and you will see today's title is, are you ready for this title? I have one nerve left and you're standing on it. I tried to shorten it, but this, so you're going to, you're going to be, this message is for me today. I'm glad you're here to hear it, but I told somebody, told somebody in the first service, I said, if no one was there, I would have still preached it so I could hear it. But uh, can we just welcome everybody who's watching online? We welcome everybody. Amen. And uh, while we were worshiping, I, I just had this in my heart that, um, I believe it's somebody in here, but I believe it's also somebody who's watching online that there is a woman who's been deeply hurt, and the Lord is going to heal you right during this service today. You're, you are going to walk out, or you're going to quit watching and be so healed of that hurt, whatever that hurt may be. All right, are you ready? Yes. You know, for the last four years, we've really been preaching grace and the love of God, and uh, I do know this, that rattles more people than just about any subject, and uh, because, uh, let me just say this before we begin, are you open to seeing things differently than what you have? Yes. I said that too until you something comes against you that you disagree with, and then you're not, so I'm just going to hold you to that. Because to really receive what God has for us in this message, I think you're going to have to be willing to see things differently. Amen? So uh, I know that everyone who is normal, <laughs> emphasis on normal, but uh, every person has somebody in their life who rubs them the wrong way. Just keep looking forward, all right? Everybody has somebody. I remember working at FedEx, and it's just like, you know, I don't believe they're the devil, but they have to be related somehow. <laughs> they're one of his rel relatives for sure. And it just seemed like all the years I worked for FedEx in the corporate world, there was somebody who was like that. And if they got transferred, somebody else rose to take that position. And... Uh, I wish I knew this message that I'm preaching today back then. It would have helped me in my joy experience. But um, I truly believe this, and um, I'm going to be real transparent with you th today. I'm always transparent, but anyway, um, this truth is just hard for me to wrap my hands around. I'll be honest. But I'm, the Lord is helping me, and I believe he's going to help all of us. Because this is what I believe. Are you ready? I believe that it is 100% the will of God for you and I to have peace and joy and victory no matter how we are treated on the outside. I said no matter how you are mistreated, no matter what, I believe the power is in us. To live a victorious, happy, joyful life. Uh, uh, because we're on this life, this journey called life. And we come across people that just, if you say something is black, they say, well, it's really dark gray. <laughs> if you say something white, well, it's really beige. And it's just like, really? It's just like sandpaper. They're just sandpaper. And I know that. God, there's part of us that, okay, there's me. I'll quit saying us. I'll just say me. There's been times in my life I just wish that if I could have these people in my life and everybody else be taken off the planet, what a wonderful life this would be. But that's, <laughs> if you heard uh, that quote, I think it's by Will Rogers. I'm not for sure. He said this. He said, you know, the Lord tells us to love everybody. But if he ever changes his mind, I've got a list. <laughs> I've got a list. But I mean, anyway, I know that God wants us to be able to have victory no matter what. But we, we say things like this. That person makes me so mad. 
Do you realize what you have just said? You've probably not said that, but I've said that numerous times in my lifetime. That person just irritates me. They are just, they, they, they. And what you are saying is they have the power and ability to dictate to you whether you have joy or not or peace or not. Is it true? Nobody has the power over you to make you lose your joy. When we say, they make me mad, that's not a true statement. You yielded your joy to them. Nobody can make you mad. It went over just like that in the first service too, but anyway. You know, especially if you're married, but I mean, we just get it in the back of our head that... I'm going to change that person if it's the last thing I do. Well, let's just be honest. It's not going to be the last thing you do because you're not going to change that person. You can attempt. And Jesus, help us all. We've attempted. But it's not, are you ready for this? It's not your goal in life to change people. I'm going to drop a bomb. This is a nuke. It's not even God's responsibility to change you. It just seems like all the oxygen got sucked out of the room. <laughs> if you're watching online, you ought to be thankful. You have air to breathe. Um, God has done everything and placed everything inside of you for you to be transformed into the life that he knows that he is destined for you to have. But he's not going to come back down to this earth and start molding you and shaping you and making you behave a certain way. It's not going to happen. And he's not going to do that to the people who are in your life as well. And you say, well, I thought you preached good news. <laughs> well, you're the ones who need to see things differently. We need to see people differently. For one, like I said, God wants you and I to enjoy the journey. But number two, it affects your health. It affects our health when we let everything get to us and everybody get to us, no matter what. How, and this is why in the last few years I've really tried to renew our minds by preaching how we see God and, and that we should rethink God because the way that you think about God, in reality, that's how you're going to treat people. And by that I mean if you believe that God is so legalistic and, and he's keeping a record of every sin that you, you make, in which 2 Corinthians 5.19 says he is not, by the way. There is no such record in heaven. I said there's no such record of heaven in heaven about any sin that you've ever committed or will commit. It's not documented by God himself. But if you're the type of person who thinks that and that God is dotting every I in your life and crossing every T, and, and if you would be just like John, James and John. You remember the story in James and John in the New Testament? The, they sit there and there are some people not following, you know, the way that they were. And so James and John took notice of them and said, Jesus, do you want us to call fire down on them? I've had that thought before. But it, what did Jesus say? You know where they got that? They got that from Elijah in the old covenant. Elijah called fire down on people and made crispy bacon out of them, man. I mean, they were, they were fried. And so James and John thought that's the religious thing to do. But what did Jesus say? You don't know what spirit you are. That's not like me and my father. That's not us. So God's heart is not to be like the Godfather and rub people out. That's not his intention. I know everybody should say thank you, Jesus. Because we're always thinking about the other guy. No, if we're talking about wrongdoing, we all fit in that category. 
Whatever God you see in the mirror is the one that you're going to be transformed into, and that's the way you think God is going to be like. But he's not. There are difficult people. Who in your life needs to have an encounter with goodness? The goodness of God. Who in your life needs to have an encounter with the goodness of God? Let me put it a different way. Who's the most difficult person in your life? <laughs> oh. Who's the most difficult person in your life? Who rubs you the wrong way? Who's sandpaper to you? Who gets underneath your fingernails? There was a torture during the Vietnam War, and they would put bamboo underneath the guy's fingernails and hammer it in there to make them talk. There's people like that on the planet. They don't even have bamboo underneath their fingernails, but that's the way they act. What difficulties in your life need to be immersed in the goodness of God? When a person is a thorn in your flesh, you need to know this. The grace of God is available in you to bring a higher measure of good into their life than the difficulty they're bringing into your life. Did you hear that? In other words, when difficulty, when it's coming from a certain person or, or personality have you taken personality tests I've taken so many personality tests I mean I don't know if I'm a an otter or a giraffe or a lion or a gopher or what you know I've taken those and I've taken the the Briggs you know the, for the the business world I've taken so many of those and uh, and it's good to know what you're like and what other people are like but no matter if, if you're an otter or not an otter, otter, which I don't know if I'm an otter, but I mean, whatever animal you are, we're still not going to be the same animal. Everybody is uniquely different. And I've come to the conclusion that God really is into variety, isn't he? I mean, he is really into variety. I mean, like, I've got uh, fruit trees in my, in my yard, and, and I thought an apple before I started doing this years ago, I thought an apple tree was an apple, was an apple, I was an apple. There's over 7,000 different varieties of apples. I think God's into variety. But even in personalities, people who are even kind of like you can be so different from you. And we want everybody to think like us and be like us. And aren't you thankful they're not? You may not be, but your spouse will say amen to that. But God's goodness is always greater than the difficulties that people bring into your life. In other words, we think when something comes in to, to be offensive or the way people are treating us, we think it's up here and that the grace of God is down here. And it's overwhelming. And so that's why we make statements like, they made me angry. They made me feel this way. And what you're doing is making what they are bigger than what's in you. When all along, we quote that scripture all, all the time. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Unless somebody is offensive toward us. And then it's the opposite. Greater is whatever is in them and what they've done than what is in me. Oh. The grace of God is available in you to bring a higher measure of good into their life than the difficulty they're bringing into yours. And when you respond with the goodness of God, all of a sudden the world's a better place to live. I mean, you can just drive down Highway 50 or any highway and you can... It won't take long to see how angry people are. I mean, road rage. People get shot now. I mean, it's not just cutting off and getting waved with one finger. I mean, now people pull out guns. It's crazy. But how we respond, we have the ability to respond like Jesus. We really do. And the heart of Jesus is like when the woman was caught in the act of adultery which would be, a, you know, a biggie sin to most religious people. And then all the religious people around said, you know, the law says, stoner. 
And that was truth. But this is the heart of Jesus. He turns and looks at him. He says, whoever is without sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone. So my point is this. Even though somebody may come against us and mistreat us and do us wrong, somebody done me wrong something. Even though that happens, the Jesus in you wants to respond the same way he responded to the woman caught in adultery. Mike, is your life perfect? If your life is perfect, Mike, then go ahead and respond the way that your flesh wants to. I'm just seeing how many perfect people are in our church. There's not any, in case you want to know. There's not. Well, God's goodness is always greater than the difficulties that come against you. So, you can say it this way. What is in you and me can dominate every circumstance that's outside of us. What is in us can dominate what's outside of us or what happens to us. These are just some things you need to meditate on. Because I dare say the day will be done today before you you can imply this to your life, uh, apply this to your life. Unless you live all by yourself and you drive all by yourself and nobody comes in contact with you. There's nothing on the outside that's stronger or more powerful than what's on the inside of you or me. When we look through the eyes of Jesus, we will get his thought patterns. We will. To see people based upon their identity instead of seeing people based upon their behavior. If you and I get a revelation that God sees you and me based upon our identity and not our behavior, would you say amen to that? Aren't you thankful that God doesn't just, he looks at everything, how you act and everything about your behavior and that's how he sees you. Just basically, strictly on your behavior and that's how he sees you. Do you know he doesn't see you that way? You say, well, what is he, blind? No. Colossians chapter 1, he says this, Christ, this is the mystery. It's a mystery which the Gentiles have not known, which the world has not known. And this is the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So God, the Father, sees you as Christ in you, the hope of glory. He sees you through the filter of Jesus. That's why you can. all the promises are yes and amen. Why? Not based upon your behavior or what you can do. It's based upon Jesus. But likewise, (laughs) this is where we have a hard time wrapping our hands around it. He wants you to see other people in the same manner that he sees you. He wants you to see other people the way that he sees them. Just like you're a son or daughter, likewise, the person that just mistreated you, that's his kid as well. It's hard. I'm not saying it is. But the more revelation that you have of what I'm going to be preaching and teaching today, the greater the revelation, the easier it gets. The more that you're able just to rest in it. Weapon is a rest. Rest is a weapon. I said that backwards. Rest. Just resting in what Jesus has done for you and me is a weapon. Why? Because the devil wants you and I to work at it. To try harder. I don't know about you, but when it comes to this message I'm preaching to you today, I've worked and I've failed miserably. I just got to walk in love more. I just got to walk in love more. I mean, I have got to just really, really walk in love more, and I just got to do this. Oh, and you do it. I just need to be more obedient. I just need to be more obedient. I just need to do this. I need to dot every I and cross every T. And if you know my personality, that is not even in my vocabulary. You can ask my secretary. It's just not in my vocabulary. It's just not me. And I've tried to be an I daughter and a T crosser. Just not me. I tried to work hard at it. I tried to be more obedient at it and everything. This is the problem with all of those scenarios that I just said. You know what the problem is and the main common denominator is? You. Me. 
I need to be more obedient. I need to try harder. I need to have more endurance. I need to be more persistent. I need to do that. And guess what? Your victory will be based upon how much tenacity you have. And when your tenacity and endurance goes down, so will your victory go down. So there needs to be another denominator. I take I out of the picture and I put Jesus. You know when you do fractions, one, half, and the denominator is the two. I want to teach you geometry or algebra real quick. One, half, the two is the denominator. So what I'm saying is you are the two. You need to take you out of the picture and put Jesus as the denominator. He's the common factor. Why? Because Jesus is always obedient. Jesus is always faithful. Jesus will always be enduring. Jesus can outlast anything. So you need to embrace what he is in you. And you can love anybody outside of you. Hallelujah. Well, it's easy to look at people and judge them. But when we respond in anger, we're reacting to people instead of responding to the Lord who loves us. We respond in anger, you're reacting instead of responding to how the Lord loves you and me. Rather than giving, our, giving in to joy, which is in you, rather than giving in to peace, which is in you, you let your thinking get hijacked. All of us have had our thinking hijacked. What do I mean by that? Instead of thinking that, you know what, that person, God really loves them. Instead of thinking that way, we, we pick up the stones. Instead of No, I'll take it back. We don't pick up stones. We get the bazooka, the rocket launcher, the AK-47 and go, I'm going to let you have it. <laughs> no, I'm not picking up a stone. Instead of responding the way that God wants us to respond to is in the peace and joy, we let our hijacking get, or let our thinking get hijacked. The issue is not, you know, God... You need to do something. And that's what, I, I pray that. God, you need to do something with this person. They're irritating me. Do something to this person. It's a prayer that never gets answered. Do something to that person. I want them to change so I do not have to rely and depend upon you. That's what we're saying. I know you don't believe that that's what you're saying, but that's what you're saying. Because of what he has done, because of what he has done, now I have the ability to love everyone. Philippians 4.13 says this. This is the amplified version. Philippians 4.13. I have strength for all things. Do you have that scripture? I have strength for all things in Christ. How many things? All things. Which means anything that I need to love somebody is inside of me. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. So in other words, he's saying, has anybody hurt you? Are you the victim uh, of an unforgivable crime? I mean, just something is just, in your opinion, is unforgivable, which there's no such thing. But by the grace of God, you can be free and healed of every hurt and wound. Every single one of them. But if you hold on to that hurt, you're going to be like the miserable um, story in the Bible uh, of the unforgiving servant. His master forgave him, but he refused to forgive those underneath him. It just makes you miserable. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. This is the Passion Translation. It says, The realm of death describes our former state. For we were held in sin's grasp, 
but now we've been resurrected out of the realm of death, never to return, for we are forever alive and forgiven of all our sins. He counts, he count, he counseled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant, what stood to indict us. He erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all and they cannot be retrieved. Everything, now that doesn't just hold true for you, it's for that person who just offended you. Everything we once were and Adam has been placed onto the cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Why should we make a decree against someone purely because of their behavior when Jesus paid the cross and nailed it to the cross? Did you hear that? We make a decree. They fill in the blank. That person is so... And you fill in the blank. What that scripture just said is, what you just made a decree about that person, Jesus nailed that on the cross, and now you're bringing it back up. You're being accuser of the brethren, what Jesus nailed on the cross. Now we say amen when it's considered what's been nailed on the cross for us. Jesus nailed that on the cross for me. But you, you rasky fellow you, no, what they did was nailed on the cross as well. And now you're making a decree about that person when Jesus has said, what you just said about them is based upon their behavior, which I took care of on the cross. So you need to see them based upon their identity the way that I see you based on your identity. Fair enough? I think that's a good thing. I don't want Jesus just to judge me based upon my behavior. Do you want Jesus to judge you based upon your behavior? I don't like that kind of thing. Seeing their true identity is going to help you to see yours. I truly believe that when we embrace this and you start seeing people the way that Jesus sees them, I think it causes you and me to have a greater revelation of who we truly are and our true identity. Your eyes get to be open greater. So it's not just for their sake. I truly believe that it's going to help you and me. The more that you yield to the grace of God in you to see their true identity, the more God is going to say, this is who you truly are, Mike. Man, that's powerful. That is so powerful. I'm going to give you some scriptures that God wants you to know. He's going to help you through this. He knows that you're just frailty, that you're a human. But you, we can't just use that as an excuse. You know, I'm only human. Yeah, and you're going to be only getting defeated every day of your life if that's what you think. You're only human. You're not only human. This is what God says in Psalms 54.4. But the Lord God has become my divine helper. Divine helper. He leans into my heart and lays his hands upon me. Psalms 46.1. God, you're such a safe and powerful place to find refuge. You're a proven help in time of trouble. More than enough and always available whenever I need you. Hebrews 4.14 So then we must cling in faith to all we know to be true. For we have a magnificent king priest, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who rose into the heavenly realm for us and now sympathize with us in our frailty. He understands humanity, for as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way just as we are and conquered sin. So now we come freely and boldly to where love is enthroned. Not where judgment is enthroned, but to where love is enthroned to receive mercy's kiss and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. C.S. Lewis, this is a quote by him. He said, everyone feels benevolent if nothing happens to be annoying him at the moment. That is so true. I can be nice to everybody when everybody's nice to me. You can be nice to everybody when everybody's nice to you. So you can be benevolent when everything's going good, but the problem is not everybody's going to do good to you. So how do you respond? How do we respond? This is a problem that Paul had. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, it's a very controversial story that I've had so many, um, I've heard so many messages about Paul's thorn. 99% of them are all negative, bad. There's some that say that Paul's thorn was some kind of eye disease. You can read some theologians. It was some runny eye gross disease. That just makes you happy. But uh, because, you know, that's what they think. Or some kind of sickness, some kind of ailment. Well, let me read the story. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, it says this. Paul was getting all kinds of revelation. I mean, left and right. He wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. And it says what the thorn of the flesh is. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. I've heard some ministers say this. Now, he was getting a messenger of Satan coming to him because... He was being lifted up in pride, and so this messenger of Satan was coming against him because he was being lifted up in pride. I just want to let you know something. Pride is a sin, and so if you're being lifted up in pride, the devil's not going to stop you and go, you shouldn't do that. Everybody agree to that? So this can't be what this story means. It can't be. But I digress. Here we go. Verse um, 8. Concerning... This thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, there again, there's people that say, well, God just didn't want to answer him. First of all, it does not say that in this scripture. It says that he asked three times. It does not say, and maybe I'm reading too much into it. It does not say that the Lord refused to answer him. I just know the heart of a father. I'll be transparent with you. A father, if a child comes up and they're really in trouble and they got a serious question and they ask me, I don't go. And ignore them. And they ask me again, no, just don't feel like talking to you right now. So it takes three times. Okay, now I'll talk to you. That's what people think. Really? Do you really think your father's like that? This is what I think. I've gone into one of my kids' bedroom before. And I mean, you, the, the, the stereo's turned up and it's... I mean, stuff is happening. You go, hey, Jared, Jared. And they're just like, Jared, Jared. Finally, you go, hey! This is what I know. When you get so emotional about something that's happened to you, you can't hear squat. You can't hear squat. So he goes on to say... And he said to me, verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast of my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is what I believe happened. Are you ready? This is what I believe. Paul went from city to city. Is everybody? This is the main thing. He went from city to city to city. And every place he went, he had revival and riot. Every single meeting. I wish he could have said, you know, he just, the blessings of God were flowing. No, people came against him. People used their own money to travel behind him and follow him and try to disrupt the meeting. To get him beaten, they would talk and tell everybody, he's against Moses. And, he, and they spread rumors and everything. So he had the meeting. I mean, people just hated him. He got locked up in prison. And, and, and it was just terrible. So he went to God and said, hey. You got to do something with all these people doing this and treat me like this. I can't even preach the gospel. You got to do something with these people. That's what I'm talking to you about today. Paul experienced it. He experienced it. The point is this God was saying, I'm not going to remove the people, Paul, but I'm going to do something far greater. Are you ready? I'm going to reveal what I've already given to you. It's called the grace of God. But I'm going to reveal it to you in such a way that when you quit trying, listen to me, when you quit trying to be, oh, I just got to walk in love. I just got to be obedient to God. I just got to love these people. And I tell you what, but you know what? I just, they're not lovable. They are his relatives. 
They're not Satan, but they are related to him somehow, God. Descendants. So I can't do this. And as long as you and I have a mentality, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. I'm trying, I'm trying, and I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. Because I'm trying to do it in my own strength. Paul was trying to do everything in his own strength in dealing with people. And God turns around and says, Paul, stop it. When you are weak, it's the time to turn to me and find that there's grace inside of you to cause you to have peace and joy in the midst of no matter what is or who's coming against you or how they're mistreating you whatsoever. You have the ability to come up above it. When you lean upon me and quit trying to do it in your own strength, when you become weak, then you'll be made strong. Woo! That set Paul free. Paul said, I'm going to glory in my weakness because when I am weak, I'm going to lean on the grace that is inside of me. I'm going to lean upon God and now nobody can take my peace away from me. Nobody can take my joy away from me. Nobody can take anything from me because I have the grace of God on the inside of me to withstand anything outside of me. They didn't take, give it to me and the world can't take it away. We sing that, but we really don't believe it. And the reason we don't believe it is because we're trying so hard to do it. I'm telling you. I am telling you. God wants to set you free today and say, when are you going to quit? When are you going to get to the, I've just come to the end of my rope with that person. Good. That's a good place to be. Now let go of the end of the rope and fall into the hands of God. Amen. I'm telling you, God wants us to have joy wants us to have peace there are people there always are going to be people in your life and my life that just rub us the wrong way that maybe even mistreat us and if you give in to it or if you try I just got to work harder at it your victory, victory will only be as much endurance and tenacity you have and let me just say this you don't have enough I don't have enough. But the good news is, you know, I just told God, you know, this week, you know what, God? I'm just weak in that area. So I'm going to lean upon you. His response is, good. I didn't make you to handle that. I didn't make you to handle that. God didn't make you to handle offense. God didn't make you to handle the mistreatment. He didn't make you to be able to say, well, I can withstand that. I'm a man's man. Yeah, you are. You'll probably get some kind of ulcer or some kind of sickness or disease. But on the outside, you're looking good. But on the inside, you're just nothing but a trash heap. You're not made for that. But God says, I can handle it. I'm made for this. I'm the one who bore it on the cross. I can withstand any offense, any attack on you. I can withstand it. But the problem is, you've got to trust me. Not me. Jesus, you do know I've said that. You got to trust me, Jesus says. You got to lean upon me. When you are weak, I am strong. And when you look at me, he will, you will hear these words. Just like Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. The stand. Amen. This is such a free. It's never easy when you have to be the one trying harder and harder and harder, working at it. I just got to work at this. I just got to, I just got to really work at this. You'll have victory as long as you have tenacity. But once you lose the tenacity, you will falter. It's not supposed to be that way. God, aren't you glad that God set it up for you and I to have peace and joy and victory no matter what? Listen to me. He set it up to no matter what happens on this planet that you and I have the ability to have peace in the midst of the storm, joy in the midst of bad news, victory in the midst of all defeat around you. He set it up so that no matter what's going on out here, he set it up that there is grace, the power of God, nuclear God, divine power on the inside of you to withstand anything that's outside of you. So we can't say, I would be a lot happier if my spouse would treat me better. We just get down where we live.
If my boss just see how valuable I truly was. Ow. If these co-workers, if you could just get rid of all of them, I could do a much better job if they were not in the office. You know what you're doing? You're putting your joy on hold. You're putting your peace on hold. You're putting, your, you're, you're putting a stipulation upon your victory and joy. And God said, there's no stipulation. Only you put the stipulation on it. It's not intended to be that way. Let me pray for you. Father, I just believe in Jesus' name that from this day forward that you would remind all of us of the grace that is within us to withstand anything that is outside of us. That we would truly have the revelation of greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That we could be the same testimony that Paul had. I will glory in my weakness for when I am weak, I am strong in him. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Help us to really get a hold of that revelation so that our lives will be a life full of peace, joy, and victory in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen. On my left and my right, these people will pray for you. The way that we do it around here, we dismiss everyone. If there's anything that you need prayer about, these people will pray with you. This message will change your life. Because everybody else's life is probably not going to get changed. But you can change the way that you see people. And you'll have a greater victory. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.